is the Home Tech Podcast for Friday, October 6th from Sarasota, Florida. I'm Seth Johnson. From Reynoldsburg, Ohio, I'm TJ Huddleston. And from Pickering, Ontario, I'm Gavin Campbell. And welcome to the Home Tech Podcast, podcast all about home automation, home technology, and Gavin, by the way, thanks thanks for sending that Canada fog down here. Like, I've been coughing all day. I don't know why. Like, we've got Canada fog everywhere. I don't I don't know why you guys, this all this smoke from Canada just ended up in Florida. I don't even know how. It's not supposed to come this way. Oh, we didn't expect it to get that far. We pushed it down just a little bit. We would think it would <sighs> stop in Boston, but we're overachievers up here. How do you have Canadian smoke and I don't? I do not know. It's the magic of weather, but... Like it's been foggy all day and I was, and I was wondering what was going on <laughs> and somebody told me, oh, this is the Canadian, uh, forest fires. They're just down here now. Took a while. I'm gonna have to say thanks, Gavin, but, uh, yeah. Oh, we set that down last month. So I'm surprised it's only now reaching. <laughs> it's kind of weird though. It's not even snowbird season. So a little, a little early to be down there, yeah. isn't it? It's very strange. Yeah. I don't know. It, it It's pushed down the Eastern seaboard, I guess. So that, that must be it. And we had, we've had a bunch of like Northern winds. Oh yeah. I'm looking at the little thing on New York times right now. And it's got basically, it's under you. It just snuck in under you, TJ. That's why you're not oh, getting good. it. I've got it. Georgia's got it. Alabama. And it's being actually pushed up through Arkansas. So maybe you'll get like, it'll loop back around and you'll get some. We had enough somewhere. already. I don't need any more. <laughs> so yeah, there, there we go. There we go. But um, lots of stuff going on too. We got we got a couple of follow-ups this week. Uh, CD attendance. I guess the numbers finally came out. I don't think we talked about this on the show. Um but uh, I guess there were 15,541 registrations and a verified attendance of 12,848. And I think I think we talked about this together before, but we were like, man, that seems kind of low. Like, it, it seemed like it was busier in there. Um, I was definitely busier. But um, there's an interesting article over on strategy.com uh, that we'll link to in the show notes. Says this is a 7.6 increase from last year, and there were 340 exhibitors in total, 94 of them being first time exhibitors, which I guess technically I was, but yeah, anyway, that's an 88% uh, percentage increase from last year. So, decent size show, but definitely not as big as it used to be. So, they also had, they also mentioned in here that both the CD Expo and they were trying to do a commercial integrator expo kind of doing those at the same sides and like combining the attendance figures. It was supposed to be bigger. So kind of should have been bigger than, than 12,000 or 15,000. If you think about it. Well, that was my first time there. And I have to say, you know, I was expecting it to be a little more packed. Um, I was surprised at how many people were there, but I mean, when I walked in there, the only packed booth I saw was a black wire booth and the rest (laughs) of the area, I was able to walk freely through the rest of it. So, you know, like, no, it's still good numbers, though, I guess. I saw I saw decent, like, demos being, like, the Josh AI booth, the Ava Remote booth. Those were packed most of the time. The demos had lines like they normally do. So, I didn't expect, I didn't expect the numbers to be this low, I guess. I, th- I thought they'd be a little bit higher. Um, I was, I was going to guess around 16, but I guess not. It, it, it's, I guess it was down the 12,000 area. So yeah, you can definitely tell when the, uh, the bad things happen, you know, 2007, there was 29,000 people and then 28, it dropped down to 25,000 and then 20,000 and then, you know, 2021 with the virtual event, 1400 <laughs> people. <laughs> so it's uh, kind of interesting and a little bit sad to see this graph, uh, when you actually look at the attendance numbers. But it is kind of weird, too, because I think my badge, like when I signed up, they give me like a registration number of like 20 or 21,000. So I don't know where they got that from then. I guess just total people registered. It's just a made up number. You get it. It's a random number. Yeah. 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 That's 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 the way I would do it. If I was nobody could guess and be like, oh, 40,000 people are at this. (laughs) Oh, my God. It doesn't go by one. Just random number. All right. One for you, one for me, two for you, <laughs> one two for, for me. you, two for me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, and I guess got a little bit of follow up from last week. I think we talked about this towards the end of the show when we were kind of looking into Philips Hue and talking about something they were doing with Matter. Um, I guess they were talking about uh, you, forcing everybody to um, create a login. And it looks like they've reversed that policy because they were they were trying to collect usage information from users without optional consent I, I guess they want to figure out how people are what people are doing to use the, the this thing and they want to get people to opt into that but i guess you need to know <laughs> who is opting in and and that was the reason for the account creation so they're going to try and do it a little bit differently or something in the future here so um i guess i will not need to um 
create that like, Philips Hue account on my Philips Hue thing that I don't even use. I need to take out because it's just not doing anything. I hate to tell you, Seth, but the account is still going to be mandatory as far as I can tell. Just the usage is not going to be mandatory. Oh. And I can almost guarantee that in six to 12 months, they're going to go ahead and just redo this policy to include collecting usage data. And nobody's even going to care at that point. But I think the big argument was uh, the big argument was that it was going to break integrations with other systems. I think that's what a lot of people were more upset about. Right. And it's good to see like when people got upset and they started raising their voice, it was good to see them reverse direction because it showed the power like of the consumer in this case, you know, if a company is going to make a dumb decision, the consumers can speak up, make enough noise and make them change their mind. So I, I like when that happens. Hmm. Okay. I guess I was having a hard time reading the little excerpt they, they put on this Reddit post, but there's a larger article we'll link to in the show notes here that explains this a little bit more. So yeah, it's kind of weird. It's like the, uh, like the Sonos uh, thing many years ago when you didn't need a Sonos account to set up speakers. And then all of a sudden they started making you sign up for an account. And I used to have so many people be like, I never had to have an account before. Yeah. And I'm like, I know, but now you do. And now Sonos sends you endless emails. Yeah, that's why. Because <laughs> they want that usage data. Yeah. I ran across a 30% coupon the other day, and I'm going to have to use it, Ooh. I think. Yeah. I've been trying to find one again, but it's only on S1 products, so a little harder mm. to find now. Interesting. Interesting. All right. Well, let's move on here. We've got a bunch of home tech headlines that came through across the door and a bunch of new products that came out this week. So uh, what do you say we uh, dive into those? Let's do it. All right. Some shocking news from Canada. Guys, ready? So, Health Canada has issued a recall for Emporia's uh, North America smart plugs due to a risk of electric shock. The plugs lack proper grounding and can expose users to the electricity that's inside of them. Uh, the smart plugs were available for purchase individually or in multi packs, and I guess a total of 2,239 smart plugs were sold there in Canada between July 2022 and August 2023. But no incidents or injuries have been reported. So kind of like a general recall, like if you got one of these things. Oh, no, this is the one. This is the one that's actually going to be remotely disabled. So, yeah, uh, the company is going to basically remotely kill these things. So you're going to have to recall them anyway. So good luck. I guess if they're not connected to the Internet, they won't be remotely disabled. But as soon as they are, they will be (laughs) remotely disabled. It's kind of wild to think about like a company just being able to do this. But I guess, you know, in case there is some kind of life threatening thing or, you know, something that you're going to get sued over, it's easier just to kill the stuff off. If it's part of a recall, there's recall insurance. These companies all buy for this. It's probably easier than just having to pay for a death or something like that. So. Gavin, uh, you, you got a bunch of these laying around? Are you, oh, I have you, none of you? them laying around, right? Because <laughs> uh, I knew when I first looked at them, they were missing some grounding to it. So I didn't feel safe <laughs> buying one. But, um, you know, I can see both sides of the argument, though. Like, uh, I can see why they would want to break it to to save people from, from getting hurt, if possible, right? And I can also see the consumers being mad, you know, that their device is bricked and it may just be working for them and they're fine with taking the risk. I don't know which side I would be on, but I could see both sides. I just hope that nobody has put this on anything important, right? That, that you know, it's going to be bricked. Like if it was on, I guess, you know, a sump pump or something like that, and then they bricked it and now you're sump, you get flooded or oh, whatever. Flooding, yeah, right? problems. Yeah, like, you know, and that's what you have to consider when you start getting into the smart home and you start putting things on important or critical things. It's like if it's cloud connected, you know, you have to be careful about stuff like that because not just this, but an update, you know, a bad firmware update being pushed by the company could break your switch or whatever. So, uh, you know, like it, it's, I, it's a, to me, it's also a dangerous move from Emporia because, like I said, people do some dumb things with these things and who knows what's out there, or what's being done. Um, what are the options, though? I don't know. It's a hard one. Is this the same same company that makes the energy monitor that you have, TJ? Correct. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well. And I, I, honestly, I feel like this is probably the best solution for something like this, right? I mean, if, if it's dangerous to use, then, like, you know, go ahead and break it. There is the concern that it is on something important, you know? Yeah. Could be like a breathing machine or, or something else that, you know, who knows what people have on it. I really but hope I you don't put your breathing machine on a smart plug. <laughs> maybe, maybe you want a, a couple seconds of uh, reality or something. I don't know. Uh, but you know, they're offering a replacement at no, no cost. So, I mean, I feel that's the best 
path forward. I mean, as long as a company is going out of their way to like make it right and get you a different product and it shouldn't cost you anything, then I think that's going to be the best solution. Yeah. And they could have disappeared and, and done nothing. The only other thing you could do is like automatically mail them a smart plug if you had their address. And you know, sometimes when I buy certain products and you get that little card, say register with us for, you know, they, they give you a reason, extended warranty or something. I do it anyways, because I've been in situations where the product actually had a recall and they actually had my information on file and they told me, um, we're recalling this product. Like, I think it was one of my vacuums they had an issue with the cord and they actually called and said, we're recalling your vacuum. You get a whole new vacuum. Right. And we just placed an order and they gave us a new vacuum. And I was kind of happy that I registered the product at that time. Otherwise, they wouldn't know I had it and I wouldn't know it was being recalled. Yeah. And you do have to make an account when you set up the at least the smart energy monitoring. So, I mean, they could easily just send a, a notification to all these you know, accounts. It's only twenty two hundred. See, if there's a, Phil- a Philips Hue recall, no one's ever going to know. No. no one's ever going to know. All right. <laughs> Ooh, you have to you have to sign up for an account with data usage in order to find out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, that's how they're going to pay for those recalls. All right, uh, let's move on here. Amazon is set to launch the first two satellites for its home internet service, Project Kuiper, I guess is how you pronounce that, on October 6, 2023. Um, this launch will allow Amazon to test the new service before mass production and eventual launch uh, up in 2020 of the rest of the satellites in 2024. Um, satellites is going to launch from uh, ULA on an Atlas V rocket, uh, and they plan to launch more than 3,000 satellites into low Earth orbit. Now, this is may sound familiar. We talked about Starlink in the past, and this is going to be a direct competitor to Starlink and the products they're selling. Um, Amazon hasn't announced any pricing details, but reports are suggesting they're aiming to undersell Starlink and uh, put the prices at below $100 per month. So... Some competition is about to heat up in the uh, in the uh, satellite internet space here, at least in, I guess this is probably going to be a worldwide thing because once you have satellites floating around everywhere, it's hard not to offer service that underneath them. <laughs> and it's good to see this because um, I, I read an article the other day and it looks like Elon Musk owns like pretty much everything up there or half of everything out of satellites up there you know he's a he's the only player up there right now yeah, um, yeah. and competition's going to be good because then it will drive down the price but it's also making space messy too right like we're dumping a lot of junk up in there and you know in two or three generations when they start going up there regularly they're going to be a lot a lot of space debris up there these are luckily uh, these are set to like they will fail that when they fail, they fail and they just fall back to earth. Like they're not, they're not, they're, they're not going to be up there, but the problem is, is more of like when they're up there, they reflect a lot of light back and they interrupt telescopes and science. So that's kind of like the big thing that people don't like them for now. And of course you see like all the UFO sightings, which are just like starling lines. So you see like all every those. week, I feel like there's a post on the local groups. Like <laughs> what is this strange formation going across <laughs> the sky? Yep. Yep be prepared for a lot more of that and it's funny you bring up a uh, space debris gavin because the fcc actually issued its first ever space to de- space debris enforcement fine it's one hundred fifty thousand dollars to dish network so this is a, a very real thing and maybe it's taken being taken a little more seriously because of all these satellites going up there that's got to be more money one hundred fifty thousand dollars is not even worth it they just approve the <laughs> pay it yeah right you know, these are billion dollar companies it's got to be significant enough you know like they're like a one employee, you know. <laughs> yeah, just Echo Star Seven, like that's it, that's. I think that failed like a long time ago, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely, definitely need some kind of satellite internet though, because I know a lot, a lot of uh, places in America, like especially the mountains and stuff like that, you cannot get good internet. So you're relying on satellite internet, and the traditional satellite internet is very awful. You're talking super slow speed, super high ping. And then most of the time, like super restricted data as well. Yeah. And so a lot of times people don't even use it until like nighttime because there's different nighttime and daytime like allocations and speeds. And so a lot of people I know in the mountains, like they don't even use it until like after like 8 p.m. or whatever it is. So anything to to help get those people connected, I'm, I'm all for. I don't know how I feel about Amazon, but it is what it is. Yep. It's these big, large players doing this. So eh, what are you going to do? Yeah. 
So uh, kind of moving on here, uh, LG has decided to spin support for ATSC 3.0 in 2024 television lineup for the United States due to patent licensing challenge challenges. Uh, the decision comes after LG had been a uh, vocal advocate for ATSC 3.0 and a leading developer in the, of television products with the, uh, the latest next gen TV technologies. Um, patent challenges and the unwillingness of certain parties to commit, uh, to, fr- I think it's Fran terms are among, um, the factors that may hinder innovation and develop, uh, development in this particular part of the industry. Um, ATSC 3.0 is, is kind of the new, uh, broadcasting standard, I guess, uh, that enables you to get like 4K Ultra HD and nice, nice audio. I think it even has like, like feedback built into it for interactive things. Like if you you could submit back information through that ATS signal somehow, ATSC symbol. It actually had some pretty cool, interesting features of it. So kind of sad to see one of the majors walk away from it. I hope I hope they can get this thing off the ground because it, it's definitely cool when you can just turn on an antenna and down and, and just over the airwaves out of thin air, just pull in 4k TV. It, it's really cool, especially like 4k ultra. And of course, it's just a bunch of battling companies now that's ruining it for the customer as usual, you know, like they need to sort this out. Um, yeah, we're just going to suffer from this. I mean, if LG doesn't put it in their TVs, okay, that's one thing you could buy a, a, a external device probably to pick up the signal if you really had to. Um, but you know, the bigger, the bigger issue is they need to sort out all the patents. And, and, you know, I, I saw they were putting like, um, encryption on some of the streams and stuff like that too. So, uh, in the end, the end user loses out. Yeah. And I guess this, this all comes down to actually one company, Sinclair broadcasting is the problem. They own hundreds Ooh. of, s- <laughs> yeah, exactly. What a surprise. <laughs> what a surprise. These grifters are here. All right. Well, they own a number of uh, hundreds of stations. Everything. Yeah. Lots of stations, pretty much your local station. Yeah. I'm and, pretty uh, sure they own every local, uh, newspaper and everything near me. So, mm-hmm. And they, they own, I guess, a number of critical ATSC patents. And they want to get paid for that, too. So uh, I hope they can get that worked out. And especially stuff that is, like, uh, has to do with airwaves and that kind of stuff. It should actually be, like, Dave Zatz has this written up as RAND uh, patents. I, I can't remember if it's RAND or RAND. I don't know. There's there's these patents that you're supposed to be able to, like, freely exchange or at, like, a reasonable rate exchange um, and when companies don't. You see this, like, with Apple and Qualcomm and google and all those kind of things like when there's a a, a technology that is like absolutely a hundred percent needed to be available for a a large industry they they have these kind of laws that are set up where you're supposed to be able to share that technology without without overcharging and and milking the market but i don't know sinclair probably not (laughs) knowing how they operate All right. Well, let's move on here. Uh, well, Gavin, do you guys have ATS Studio up there, or is it? Is it? What, what do you guys do for broadcast? Um, we point our antennas towards Buffalo, and the signals, <laughs> get it over the there. signals <laughs> bounce off the lake and make it to Toronto. No, seriously, we get like thirty channels, but they're all like, you know, all our local news is Buffalo news. New York, you know, so th- that's what we work with. That's hilarious. That's fun. Yeah, you'll you'll get this if it ever comes to Buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> I was just looking, um, Tableau, which we've talked about a show or two ago, uh, their newest streamer only supports 1.0. It doesn't even support support 3.0. And I would imagine it's probably because of these patents as well. Could very well be. Um, it, it would be nice to, to have nice things, but... All right. Well, um, let's move on here. A, uh, a recent study. I, I thought this was actually pretty cool. A recent study conducted by Parsons Associated reveals that 20% of internet households in the U.S. own now own a video doorbell. It's a big increase over from just 4% in 2017. And surge of adoption largely attributed to the success of Amazon-owned Ring uh, and other doorbells like it. Um, Despite unfavorable economic conditions, the purchase of smart home devices remains pretty steady and a large number, but a large number of devices per household has actually dropped down below seven to compared to eight in 2021. So kind of some uh, good news if you're in the uh, video doorbell business, uh, not so good news if you're in maybe the everything else business, but we, I don't know, we kind of watch these uh, reports from parks because they, they like to like keep their ear to the ground on, on in, in the pulse of the industry here and can kind of like tell you where most things are going uh, when it, when it, when it comes to 
uh, like IoT installs in the home. And uh, I don't know. We'll link to the story over at Z Pro. Check that out. Check out the survey. Um, but it, it, I, I, I do know these are at, these are everywhere now. Like video door, video doorbells ring, blink doesn't matter. They're just they seem to be just about everywhere. Yeah, that's a that's a crazy increase. 16% in just six years. Yeah. But I feel like, I don't know, 20% still seems really low to me because it seems like every house I go to has a video doorbell in some capacity. But there, I'm sure there's a lot of areas that just don't use them in general. And I'm mainly in a city and traveling in, in and around the city. So that makes sense that I'm probably seeing a higher number compared to somewhere that's maybe more rural. Yeah. Or, or maybe a neighborhood that I don't know. They, that people don't find them. Like, say you live in a, gate, a, a secure, gated community, or even like I'm thinking in here, like in in Florida, we have like many condos, but we also have trailer parks. <laughs> like, you probably don't need a video doorbell at your on your trailer. I don't know if you can even get one, but you know, maybe you can. But I'm thinking of like the t- stereotypical Florida trailer park here, the ones that are just like tiny little, like the old school parks not the not the newer looking trailer homes yeah not many uh doorbells on those uh type of buildings <laughs> exactly i don't know and, and they're they're generally like lo- a lockdown community where there's a security gate point a checkpoint gate like an actual security guard working there before they let anybody in so for the most part and unless there's a problem with like deliveries or anything like that i don't think anybody would have something like that and and, and you may just use mm-hmm. a, a camera at that point you wouldn't use a video doorbell and I don't, I don't have an official, you know, like poll or anything like that. But in my neighborhood, like I'm seeing more and more people put these on. Like it's going, and not just video doorbells, just uh, like cameras in general. Um, especially as crime increases, because it's been on the uptick, uptick recently, right? With car thefts, more and more people are getting cameras installed in their houses. So that industry seems to be doing well, but they're also going with the cheap cameras, the do it yourself cameras. I can install it, you know, and they do it, you know, all themselves. Um, that number, like TJ said, it seems low. It feels like there's a lot more people with that. Unless you're starting to ca- count condos, because a lot of condos are in Toronto, you can't really put these on your condo doors. Um, so that eliminates a lot of that. So it has to be just houses, really. So last year, research released last month found 41% of U.S. internet households, and I think this is households that have internet, own a smart home device. 63% own a smart TV. 13% own a smart light bulb and 87% subscribe to a video streaming service. Numbers are, the numbers are impressive. I mean, it's, that's a lot of people, a lot of people with TVs. Where are they getting <laughs> their dumb TVs from? Why, uh, that number seems low. I can't find a dumb TV anymore. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I want a dumb TV, please. Let's move on here. Speaking of streaming services, Disney's, Disney Plus is going to be restricting password sharing in Canada. Starting from November 1st, the company announced a policy change in an email to Canadian subscribers stating that sharing account credentials outside of households will no longer be allowed, Gavin. So you better uh, you better rein that in, that practice in of, uh, I guess, Netflix hit you guys first and then uh, came to us. And then I'm sure Disney is going to hit you guys first and then and come to us. I gave my sister back her Netflix account. So, you know... Um I'll only take over her Disney during, you know, like Mandalorian and stuff like that. And then I'll give it back to her for all the other shows. Must be, uh, must be payback for Canada sending all the smoke down to Florida. So. <laughs> exactly. You're running our park. <laughs> yeah. The mouse is not happy. Attendance is down because of Canada. <laughs> All right. Well, there's there's no uh, I guess there's no um, details on how they're actually going to enforce the policy uh, yet, but um, they say it's coming. It was announced pretty much in like Q3 earnings call. So they're exploring ways to address the shared accounts issue that uh, nobody seemed to have a problem with at first. But it seems like now that they are everything is is is, is money driven and uh, you know they they've got a they've got to get those numbers up and uh, one of the numbers they like to get up is profit so uh, speaking of raising numbers Netflix is planning to raise streaming service prices again in the coming months according to the Wall Street Journal the price increase will occur in several markets globally starting with the US and Canada a uh, specific amount of the price hike is still unknown but just last year Netflix raised the prices across all plans uh, starting with the uh, standard tier costing about fifteen forty nine a month, and a premium plan costing uh, twenty dollars a month. So yeah, uh, just one year of uh, Netflix plan, and then now they're saying, "Oh, we're gonna have to raise it again." 
that's just the consumer now paying for everything that they've given the uh, writers for the strike. <laughs> oh, now. Yeah. Like, like they're not they're not going to take it out of their own pocket. They're going to be like, all right, we'll give you all raises, everything you want. We'll just raise our price and make everyone pay for it. You know, and, you know, I, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not going against what the writers are doing. Like, don't get me wrong here. I'm just saying <laughs> these companies get greedy and they'll find a way to pay for these things. Yeah. Well, one one interesting thing that did come out of the WGA getting their contract uh, fixed up with these with with these uh, streaming services is that they were asking for um, basically a de- they de- they were demanding that like numbers be released. And I guess this these it was one of the things that got agreed to. And that that. That just doesn't happen. Like Apple, Netflix, they do not they do not tell you how their shows have performed. And the writers want to know like how how much should we get paid? Like we should be getting paid for this. And I guess they're they're supposed to be keeping it like quiet and and I don't know how they're going to do this. Like it's supposed to be this thing that like only a few WGA staff members go in and look at and and see or whatever. But then like Hollywood is like the most leaky industry ever when it comes to bragging rights about how well your show is doing. These numbers are not going to stay secret. I don't really know how they're going to, that's going to happen, but that means I guess in a number of months, we're going to start actually seeing real numbers start circulating around in rumor mills and we're going to actually know like how well these shows are doing on Netflix and Apple TV and that kind of thing. It'd be interesting. Well, I think, I think Canada just released a, a law, put in a new law where they're going to have to register their numbers nice, um, mm-hmm. and, and, and release that information in Canada. At least I don't know if that that's where they'll limit the market to. So we'll only see that this show did well in Canada, but they, it probably does not reflect the U S right. But well, anyway, th- there's, a, there's now an actor happening. now that gets paid. It doesn't matter if it was filmed in Canada or whatever, like, or the studio is in Canada. Like now if an actor is yeah. getting paid and they're part of the WGA, they're, they're going to get those numbers. So that that's great for them. Yeah. And, and that's something people have been wanting for a long time. They wanted to see how uh, Netflix's shows were doing. Right. And Netflix always said, you know, numbers like, they don't on matter. A specific show, it didn't matter. <laughs> yeah. It was just the We're numbers overall. To Nobody else should. Yeah, it's like that show's here just to get people here, but then they come here and they'll probably watch all our other shows, right? So we'll see where this goes. Like, I'm just I'm curious if the numbers will be impressed or disappointed. I could kill Cowboy Bebop. I'm still bitter about that one. That was a fun show. It wasn't good, but it was fun. So. <laughs> Yeah, well, I just I just got Netflix back, so of course they would raise prices and do all this stuff. So you're you're welcome, everybody. Well, get it while you can at a discount because the price is going up next soon. <laughs> you may <laughs> at some you point may have a month or two. <laughs> all right, uh, let's, we've got a ton of new products here, so let's just kind of plow through these. Uh, Raspberry Pi Foundation announced the release of the new Raspberry Pi Five. It's got a 2.4 gigahertz quad core, 64 bit ARM Cortex A67 CPU. It's got a bunch of video GPU stuff. Can do dual 4K P60 HDMI displays with HDR support. It's got some H- HEVC decoders. Um, it's got a uh, dual band Wi Fi AC, Bluetooth 5.0, gigabit Ethernet with PoE Plus support, if you get a little hat for it, I think. Uh, has two USB 3.0 ports and two USB 2.0 ports and the micro SD card slot as well. Uh, all good stuff, all big improvements. It seems like it's, it's like a notable computer, but what it means is like, we're got a nice new platform to put all sorts of fun home automation platforms on, uh, home animation products. I can finally, hopefully I can find a Raspberry Pi four thing now and actually buy one of those. If everybody's clamoring after one of these, <laughs> CJ, you're shaking your head like, nope, they don't exist. Uh, it, it would be nice to actually buy, buy a, I, I have a project I still want to do that has a, I need a Raspberry Pi for in the 3B plus thing that I have is so old, it won't work with it. So I, I want to get my bird thing up and listen to birds and figure out what birds are singing in my yard. <laughs> yeah. I know the, I know the specs have gone up tremendously since the original Raspberry Pi, but the, the starting price is $60 kind of hurts me. Um, just because it's not a computer you're going to use for like small projects anymore. It, you know, it's a computer that's competing against other computers at that point, but it is, it is interesting to see them keep developing this. I wish they would just do a PCIe, uh, slot though, and keep the micro SD card. Cause some people are going to want that, but I just want a, a PCIe, uh, this one has, or like an M2 slot. It has a PCIe slot on it. I don't know what they're going to, you can attach to that though. Yeah. I don't think that's going to be for storage though which is what i want pcie 2.01 x1 
interface. Uh, you might be able to get some storage on that. Just give me the M.2 slot, though. <laughs> the MVME <laughs> slot. I don't know. One of them. <laughs> Never happy. Yeah, I know. Yeah. G- Not for 60 bucks, I guess. Give me the Raspberry Pi for less than $60, but also I'm going to strap on a SSD that costs 200 So <laughs> No, you can buy them now for like $25. <laughs> I have one here that's like 256 from Kingston, and it was like $30. Fair, fair enough. <laughs> and that's that's how much a, uh, a decent micro SD card costs anyway, so I feel like that's pretty pretty good uh, compromise there. But is, any, is anybody going to buy one? Seth, you're not buying one. Gavin, are you going to buy one? Uh, I'm going to try it and buy a four now. Oh, it looks like there's a four for $55 on Adafruit, so maybe I'll get that one. Ooh, there you go. I've never, I've never had a need for Raspberry Pi, but... At the same time, too, I'm I have my Unraid server, so everything I run, I just add it in a Docker container or VM on that. I guess Raspberry Pi was good if you don't have something like that. It's low power, very powerful, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I just personally ne- have never had a need for one. Well, I'm just gonna say this is dead on arrival. It doesn't have AI or matter. <laughs> I mean, what are you gonna do with a piece of technology in 2023 without AI or matter? Even my phone has Mac. Exactly. Yeah. This is garbage. This is garbage. Ignore the cost. But. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, man. Add $1,000 to it and still still can't pay for the phone. <laughs> oh, it's got matter now. That's sweet. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> got to pay for licensing, I guess. Mm, who knows? All right. Move on to some actual really cool products here we we, we have from Leviton. Uh, this, this one wasn't what I thought at first, but it turns out to actually be pretty cool. They've introduced, Leviton has introduced a new smart GFCI outlet, uh, which is designed for damp and wet locations like kitchens, bathrooms. Um, Now, it's got a built-in Wi-Fi adapter and it comes in both 15 and 20 amp flavors. So, that's pretty cool. You don't really see those 20 amp switches available, that smart switches, so to speak. Um, But, it's, it's, this is different, I think. This is, this is like, it's not allowing you to turn on and off the outlet like a traditional smart outlet would be. What they're calling a smart outlet here is basically like it's telling you if that GFCI is actually tripped. So you can go do something about it. And, and Gavin, you mentioned like um, sump pumps earlier. This would be great for like refrigerators, sump pumps, stuff in the garage that like you want to make sure that's on and running. Like say you have a refrigerator in the garage. And yes. Usually, at least above code here, it's like if it's in the garage, it's got to have GFCI on it. Like you could use one of these outlets, even up to 20 amps and have no problem with it. But if something like went off, it would have a way to notify you uh, through the the Leviton app or, or whatever. They're, uh, yeah, my Leviton app. So that's nice. I, I And it, there's also it also has a um, uh, an alarm or something on it that'll go off like an audible alarm um, that can beep or something uh, if, if it's off. So I, I, I didn't I thought, that, oh, this is dumb. But then I started reading about it. I'm like, oh, this is this is actually smart. This is this is what you should have used instead of those recalled outlet switches on your sump, on your on your sump pump. <laughs> and usually these outlets are they're at the beginning of a chain, right? Like in the circuit, right? So they'll monitor multiple outlets along that chain, everything basically after it, right? Yeah. And they're usually put um, anywhere where the outlet can, I guess, come in contact with water. So bathrooms or like you said, the garage or outside. Um, so yeah, it's good for monitoring that and a lot of things. And I'm a big fan of just monitoring things in general around the house because you sometimes if your outlet keeps tripping, it's a sign of something else going on. Right. Um, and it's either a bad outlet or something along that line is not good. And, you know, you can go take care of it at that point. But it's Leviton. It's a Wi-Fi product, which means what? Another app on your phone more than likely it might not integrate or it's cloud dependent who knows well the the auto alarm isn't going to be cloud dependent so you you've got that going for yeah, you yeah we shall know yeah <laughs> yeah i thought it was kind of interesting i wish you could control the outlet i understand not being able to reset it you know cuz that's kind of like a safety mm-hmm. feature and everything you shouldn't really bypass that but it is kind of weird that you're not able to control the outlet still switch bot is like hold I, my beer <laughs> Yeah, well, maybe they couldn't, like, I don't know, it's Leviton. They should have been able to figure out a way. But maybe they couldn't, like, figure out a way to, like, control the outlets, but n- not mess uh, mess with the reset button or something. I don't know. Just seems like a weird product line to me. Yeah. I mean, if it's something that's out of sight, out of mind, like, especially, like, a sub pump or something like that, you definitely want to know if, if the 
the breaker's been tripped and uh mm-hmm. yeah yeah i could i could totally see have it, how this could have an like an advantage if it's something you're not looking at every day but just kind of needs to run there in your house and shouldn't be tripped by a f- crazy gfci cuz that happens all the time like something will get kicked on the gfci will be cranky and be like nah i'm not i'm not living today it turns off and then you don't know but now you do, now you will uh well speaking of 11 times, they actually really something actually also pretty cool called um, Decor Edge, which is a innovative wiring solution that, that for on switches and outlets that, that basically you can get in there and 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 how do you describe this? They basically use Wago clips on the outlet or or the switch itself, and and now you just pull back this little lever, slide the thing in, and clip it down, and you're, you're good to go. Um, pretty cool. They they have uh, UL CSA uh, approved. They meet all the codes and everything, and they're backed by a two-year limited warranty as well. I don't, I, I don't know. This is this is actually really cool. A little quick wire clamp terminators. I think we're all in love with these things. <laughs> Just like uh, even even what is that? The snap thing, uh, speaker snap mm-hmm. company. Like we'll get them. We'll we'll use Wago clips on everything if if possible. So I, I, I this is this is a good thing. This this is not bad at all. Yeah, I wish I would have known about these outlets because I just bought a ton of outlets and replaced them all over my house. And so a lot of my outlets do not have a grounding wire. And so I just, I just installed three plug outlets anyway, because I didn't want to deal with adapters and all that stuff. Um, But my favorite feature of this is not the lever connectors, but the automatic lining up of the plate, (laughs) uh, which I didn't notice until Gavin said something, because that is one of the most aggravating thing about installing switches and outlets in like multiple locations is that it always takes a while for them to line up. You have to leave the the plates loose or the uh, the devices loose so you can get them into the right spot and everything like that. And it's just so aggravating. It's a lot of time spent. And that's a really cool feature of that. So Decora Edge is what they're calling that. Yeah, like it basically it can slide back and forth easier, or it kind of lines them up, but it also slides them back and forth easier. This is my so can... my new go to product for outlets. That's for sure. <laughs> can you just buy the little thing, the Decor Edge thing? That's all I want. Like put that on other things. Yeah, right. <laughs> just like put them on everything. Yeah, yeah. Can can this just become a standard in the industry? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and the and the lever connectors. I mean, because like making the little stupid loop for the the screws and then like getting underneath there is awful. And then like jamming it into the back is also awful because sometimes it just comes out. And so like I feel like this would just be way more secure than either one of those options. Yeah. I would say yes, but unfortunately Sinclair Broadcasting owns a lot of patents on this. <laughs> so we're probably not gonna see it anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, it's not gonna work out. <laughs> <laughs> Outlets, they're uh <laughs> Big markets. Crud. You know, the electricians will fight you on that because it will make their job way too easy. But, you know, to me, this was a significant update to something that's been there for a while. Um, those Wago clips, brilliant because now it's plastic on the side. It's not metal. Mm-hmm. And when you get the bigger boxes, these bigger boxes, you're trying to jam them into a small box. You have to worry about that little metal somehow touching the side. You know, um, it's happened to me. I've blown a switch that way. You know, I usually just put a little electrical tape around it just to stop that from happening. But you're working with small spaces and a bigger switch these days. And that took care of that. I mean, it had auto grounding on it, you know, which I thought was kind of cool. It grounds to the to the actual box itself, um, you know, and then the lining up was awesome. The one thing I did not see, and it's hard to tell sometimes from these articles, but sometimes um, in the back of your switch, you'll have like on one terminal, you'll have two um, places for you could shove a wire into, right? Um, and that just kind of, I, I like that because again, you're working in a small space that prevents me from having, when I have two lines coming into that box, I don't have to create a pigtail mm-hmm. and it saves me that extra space of another moret in that box. So you could just shove two of them in the back there. This one, I didn't think had it and I would miss that in some of my, my, um, outlet boxes, but uh, again, I love the I love the upgrade. To me, it's an upgrade. Um, I'd love to see this on smart switches. Um, and yeah, like you said, if somebody can make a little add-on template that we could put on every switch that lines them up automatically like this, that that would save so much frustration. I still have switches and outlets that are crooked and i just don't care because i I got fed up you know it was one of those things like nobody's gonna notice no one will notice right i just leave it there Um, it's kind of like my my sunken in switches you know just don't don't look at them too long yeah 
They're all automated, so I don't have to touch them. And just never show Richard. No, no. I was looking at Home Depot to see how much these are, and they're about $2.50 a unit here in the States. I guess they're not available. God, so worth it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a dollar more than what I paid for like a normal outlet, I think. So, And, and for the amount, it's a one-time cost. For the amount you, you'll buy, right? It's not really that significant, you know, a, a price for these things, right? Like if you had 30 of them in your house. These are the labor savings or the frustration savings, I think is what DJ's yes. getting at. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's nice. It's nice. All right. Well, I can pick them up. They've got four of them in stock locally. I can pick them up tomorrow. Here we go. Four, four, I guess 40 of them in stock, technically. Ooh, buy all 40. Let us know how it goes. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going Just around. Switch out all your outlets. No, thank you. <laughs> Did that once. <laughs> a lot of mine, uh, so the boxes were from like 1969. And as soon as you started like unscrewing things and the boxes, it would just like crumble in the back. I'm like, oh, well. Next person <laughs> has to deal with this, not me. <laughs> Back it goes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're one of those homeowners, aren't you? Nope, not my problem. Not my problem. Until I take it apart next time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm like, oh, who did this? Oh, I did. Never mind. Yeah, it went back together. Who cares? <laughs> my job here is done. Wipe hands on pants. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, let's move on here. We've got a new um, we got a new lock from a Ye- from a new pair of locks from Yale. Uh, Yale has released two models of its Assure Two lineup uh, smart locks: one with the fingerprint reader and one with support for Apple's HomeKey. But you can't have both. <laughs> The Yale Assure Lock 2 Touch adds a fingerprint reader and comes with keyed and, un- and key-free versions, while the Yale Assure Lock 2 Plus, these model numbers are crazy, uh, supports home key and can be opened with the Apple uh, Watch or the iPhone. Uh, it's a really cool feature. Definitely recommend it. Uh, both locks are um, compatible with Apple Home and uh, the Yale app as well as whether as well as other smart home platforms, uh, but of course not with Matter. So Yale, you don't matter specifically this week. Thanks a lot. Um, the uh, Assure Lock Two Plus will be uh, one of only four consumer level home key locks in the U.S. Uh, the Touch is priced at one ninety nine, and the Lock Two Plus is two oh nine uh, for the home key one. So there we go. Well, the good thing about Yale is I think they use all the same modules. So even if it doesn't directly support Matter by buying it with it, you should be able to plug it in and probably use it the same way. Yeah, it could be. So that that way Gavin can buy one and test it out for us. <laughs> I really want to buy one, but they're making this confusing and hard. And I don't want a Wi-Fi version. I want, do they have a Bluetooth, not Bluetooth, a Zigbee or Z-Wave version still? Last I knew they had the Z-Wave for sure. I don't know if they have the Zigbee one anymore. On the Azure Lock 2? Yes. I'll probably pick one of those up. I like, uh, because I bought mine. My, mine's the 2 and it's got. I bought it with Z-Wave. This one specifically says the Plus works Bluetooth out of the box and can be bought with the Wi-Fi module for two eighty nine, but won't work with the Z-Wave module. So there you go. Yeah, and if you go to their website, you can buy the y- Yale Zigbee Smart Module for fifty dollars. But will it work with this? Because like, that's what Seth was saying that hmm. the Z-Wave module won't work with it. I I think well in the past you could just take any module and plug it into any Yale Sherlock. And yes. it would work. So I doubt that's changed, but I couldn't answer that for sure. And why couldn't we get all the features? Like, why can't we get fingerprint and home key? Well, you can, you know, in I fact, want all for the at least $100 less <laughs> if you buy the Acquire one. <laughs> exactly. If Acquire <laughs> could do it, Yale, why couldn't Yale do it? You know, why are they know. making you choose? Why not give us one with everything, you know, and charge 100 bucks more? Yeah, they just want too much money for it. That's why they can't compete with that $200 price point. If you've got, well, they could if they if they offered as many finishes as, uh, oh, wait, Acquire has no finish options. So Ooh, yeah. Well, and Yale has three. Exactly. So, I mean, it's got black suede, oil rubbed bronze, and satin nickel. <laughs> and you can get the Yale of Sherlock 2 or the Yale of Sherlock 2 Touch or the Yale of Sherlock 2 Plus. Yeah, and I really I really like my Yale. I, I made a mistake, and I knew I made a mistake when I bought it. I went with, went with one one that didn't have physical buttons it's got like the the touch screen thing going on and i that i feel like that's just the worst thing for a lock because most of the time when you walk up to the door you just want to like quickly press the buttons and just like do it but this one you have to like hit the little yale symbol or you like I, you starfish the keypad and then <laughs> that like lights it up and then you type in your code but sometimes your code doesn't work because you didn't type it correctly or you know it, it doesn't register your your finger presses so i feel like the the capacitive touchscreen or whatever that is is just awful you see you're doing your automations wrong 
that lock should be unlocking before you even get to it when it detects you <laughs> yeah you know I, I barely have to touch my lock because when we come home it unlocks automatically for us right when we leave it locks automatically for us we gotta fix up your automations tj uh we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later all right <laughs> <laughs> and uh i i will say uh the little apple watch integrations or the home key i guess i use the watch all the time i have the fingerprint reader thing set up as well but i don't use that as much um or at all really uh, just walking up tapping i mean you you really just put your watch like right next to the thing uh it works great and when i i got this new, i got the new watch finally everything transferred like even the new phone every it all transfers over it just pops there the the key to your house just gets transferred into your wallet uh as you get the new phone you, there's no setup or anything involved so it's really it's really one of the nicest features i i just don't think i don't think many people have started to use i don't think you would need the z way you definitely need the bluetooth thing to do that on the t- uh the plus right because you would need you would need that for apple integration or maybe not maybe you could just it would go over home kit by wi-fi too so yeah, I guess it makes sense that it's only Bluetooth. Yeah, and last I knew, they it worked natively through Bluetooth, and then if you wanted Wi-Fi, you had to you had to get their little adapter. It was like a little bridge that connected to the lock via Bluetooth, and then that bridge connected to Wi-Fi. So it always seemed kind of a little janky to me for that setup. But if you just get the Z-Wave version, it's just the Z-Wave module, and it just pairs directly to the hub. So, and my my main reason is for integrations with other systems. I I don't care if it's Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, but if I can't integrate it with Home Assistant or Habitat or anything I want to uh, integrate it with, then I don't really want a lock like that because I want to automate the locking and unlocking of that lock. Yeah, and if you're not automated with Home Assistant, then you're doing it wrong. <laughs> exactly, Home Assistant supports everything. Exactly, and if they don't, they will. They will somehow. Somebody will do it. So um, it's a last new product here. It's kind of cool. This is a this is a bridge that we've talked about before um, from Innovo, but they've released what's called the Magic Cube Aura. It's a, basically a middleware hardware that allows Elon to communicate with thousands of devices. Uh, it's fast and provides the necessary technology and can control devices in both homes and businesses. It has 32 gigabit EMC storage. Four gigabytes of RAM. I don't know. It's it's a fast computer thing here that they're going to be setting up uh, to basically. I think these guys were basically running Home Assistant in the background, and they wrote their own like integrations to basically take the stuff that you can do in Home Assistant and plug it in over into the Elon interface. So all the stuff you can't do in Elon, you you now can. And it's a pretty good pretty good idea. Yeah, I got I got this on pre order, so I'll let you know whenever I get it. I think it ships October tenth, from what I remember. Um, so I should have it, was it next week or the week after? Um, but I'm really excited for it because I have a lawn integrated with, or I'm, I, I should say I have home assistant integrated with a lawn, uh, through my home assistant setup. And so you can download the driver and you don't even need their little device for this. So you can just have home assistant, um, and then you can connect it with the Elon driver and it, it works, but you really need the WebSocket setup. Um, and you have to set up like SSL and a bunch of other stuff on your home assistant setup in order to do it. And so for this device, uh, just, you know, you just basically plug it in and it does all that stuff for you and it'll work locally with home assistant and Elon. And so my plan is to get this and back up and restore my home assistance uh, instance to this device and then use it to integrate all of my stuff with a lawn, um, all my light switches and everything. And then I'll be able to use it with Josh. So <laughs> home assistant will work with Josh very shortly. <laughs> That's a nice way of getting it done. <laughs> Yeah, I was looking for a way to do that. And I was like, the only the only ones that I could tell, and I haven't done a deep dive, is that you can use the Vera or Easy Low uh, hub in order to get that in with Josh. But I'm, I'm not going back that route. So I'm glad this came out when it did. Um, the last one, it didn't really support USB hubs. And so you couldn't you could use Home Assistant with a lawn, um, but it wasn't like possible or it was kind of janky to use. Uh, Z-Wave dongles and Zigbee dongles and stuff like that. So this one basically natively supports it and it should be way more of a plug and play device. Yeah, that'd be nice. Do you know if they have made their own kind of like interface over the top of Home Assistant or you basically just dropped into Home Assistant to set this stuff up? Yeah, it's literally just Home Assistant. Hmm. Interesting. So as far as I know, they're not doing anything special minus the driver for it. Right. 
which just integrates with Home Assistant and basically says, oh, here's your lighting devices. And then we'll translate what Home Assistant does into a lawn language and which is, you know, it, the, and to give you the access to the interface that way. That's that's really, that's, uh, that's not a bad idea. It's not a bad idea. Good job. Yeah, it's genius. And the price of it is really good. I don't think they say prices on their website, so I probably shouldn't say. But the price of it, I think, is really good for what it is. Yeah, especially if they, you have somebody. So what, what I what I see here, and I just don't know the the the, the most the, the most thing you can do here is uh, to to support this project is is support like because I can tell you that most integrators will get involved with Home Assistant and cross their eyes pretty quickly. But if they can get in and they can tell you like where to click and what, how to set stuff up, because um, Home Assistant generally involves lots of reading instructions, and I that's not common in our industry in general. So. If they can get in there and make it like easy to set up and do stuff, I think they're it's going to be a win. Yeah, I don't. They're not even doing that though, which I find remarkable. It's basically just literally Home Assistant on a computer, and so it's not, as far as I can tell, it's not skinned or anything. Like you know, if you get like an Android device and and you whatever manufacturer it is, they basically have their own skin and how it works and everything like that. This is literally just Home Assistant on a computer. Hmm. And so they're not doing anything that wise. I I don't know if the new one does, though, obviously, because I don't have it yet. Um, But the old one, it was just home assistant on a computer. You plugged it in the network and then you just use the like home assistant. Well, why wouldn't you use home assistant running on like a giant unraid thing? Is it just because of all the extra setups that they do for you? Well, I mean, that's my laziness talking. Oh, so, like, okay. it's it's literally so this this makes it easy because it already does the WebSocket thing for you. Yeah, and so like communication is instant, and with the without the SSL setup, um, it uses HTTP or HTTPS, which still has a lag to it as well, hmm. and so it's just not as fast. Gotcha. And their like their official hardware does not have this problem, and I, I wouldn't have this problem with my home se- my home assistant set up if I had the time to do all this, and I, I just don't. So, I actually asked Gavin for help, and and Gavin was like, "Nope, not helping you with that." So that that tells you. He said he said if you send me a Josh AI system, I'll help you do it. Yeah, like, <laughs> he, said, <laughs> send me, he said no, no for free. Send me a Josh and the you know oh, the for free the, the API. I think that's the term of service. The, yeah, sorry, the API documentation. I'll work on something for you. You know, but um, yeah, API. That's funny. When it when it comes to SSL and certificates and stuff, that's not my strong point. I I really get lost in that stuff. So I unfortunately I couldn't help you with that. It's all right. It's like me and websites. You know. Seth's over here throwing up websites every five seconds, and I'm like, I don't even know how to update any of this. Uh, they've made that they made that a lot easier. I'm I'm surprised it hasn't come like close to like Home Assistant. I'm sure it, it is somewhere. I haven't really looked into it, but like in general, securing a website is is like a one click thing these days. If you're on a managed provider, or like you just paste something into a command line from a from Let's encrypt and it does it automatically. Like it just sets up, and then really you just have to worry about it being installed correctly and renewing on time. I've had that happen a couple of times to me on servers. It's like, whoops, the auto renew did not work. I wonder why. But they'll email you too. It's kind of nice. So anyway, uh, this sounds like a really cool product, and um, yeah, I don't know. I hope they they exp- they they branch out. Well, maybe not because it'll kill a bunch of my driver integrations. But eh, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah could you imagine yeah i mean this from, from what i can see that or kind of understand what you're talking about and what they've done i don't think that they're very far away from being able to move this product over to, to a control four setup um outside of like control four has a lot of integrations as well like natively so you know maybe it doesn't doesn't quite make sense but this also gives you access to many 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 more things um, that you don't have access to on Control 4. Yeah, I've I've put this as a, a, a request for Josh AI. So wouldn't that be, like, if you could just pair this directly with Josh AI and then bring all your automations into that, you would have a full-scale yep. automation yes, platform yes, at that point. Yes, yes, <laughs> like, Literally, that would be it. <laughs> so I think I think it would be smart. Josh AI, anybody over there is listening to this. I think you should jump on that. With, with products like this, it makes like uh, any newcomers into the space, because usually newcomers come with a new hub. They spend a lot of their time writing their own drivers and, and doing doing work that's already been done, right? Where you get like um, libraries like Zigbee to MQTT and Z-Wave to uh, JS, right? And you just, you know, integrate those. Then you don't have to write all those Zigbee and Z-Wave drivers. And you have thousands of products automatically working with your system easily, right? So doing something like this, 
this opens up those kind of doors as well, too, because they, like you said, Josh AI could just add this in and all of a sudden they have all these products that now work with their systems, right? So it's crazy to think about. Do they charge like per driver on this or just basically they have to, right? There's got to be some license yeah, on the Yeah, from what I can tell, there's a couple different ways that the drivers are broken up, but it's still not, I don't think it's as much as it could be, <laughs> if that makes sense. Interesting. Because you could, you could get in a lot of trouble doing this. Like a lot. Of, like, there's so much money you could spend with all the integrations you get. That'd be really cool. Oh, yeah. Well, and that's the thing is like, I mean, with this device, uh, I mean, what drivers do you have to buy anymore? Well, it would be like the, I guess that's what I was asking. Do their bridge drivers that they have basically to convert what? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's what I was curious about. So, yeah. Cool product. Uh, we'll have to keep an eye on these guys because I think they can do some damage. <laughs> it's really cool. Um, I guess we'll give them the uh, Who Matters This Week award because no one else did. So um, even though it's not a matter product, but they matter. They matter in our hearts. So there we go. Um, all the links and topics we discussed tonight can be found over in our show notes over at hometech.fm slash 454. Uh, I, I guess we have a technically a pick of the week this week. Uh, this is called the uh, the Brew Spider. <laughs> It's a device that allows home brewers and small breweries to have precision control over the temperature and pressure during uh, fermentation. And um, well, first of all, I'm, I'm disappointed it doesn't look more like a spider and have little eight sensors that come off rather than six. I think that's a big fail on their part, but you know, it's still a Kickstarter stage, I guess. But um, I don't know. It's, it does <laughs> time to change. Yeah, they, they have time to, to put two more things on there for me. Uh, it, it has temperature control, has heating elements. I, I guess it integrates with a lot of the things that um, uh, people are using already for uh, th this type of control, but it, it kind of gives you deep integration and you can kind of see all of the, uh, the, the sensors all gathered up into one spot in a, in a nice refined package. And then also there's a, a phone app that you can use to watch your stuff, your beer brew. And when it becomes the right beer, then you can drink it. That's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> I made TJ laugh. <laughs> You know, I wish they had this in university because when I was in university, my roommates used to uh, brew beer and they had like kegs behind our couch and we'd be <laughs> watching TV and you just hear these things gurgling and our whole, our whole floor smelled like beer the whole time. <laughs> and yeah, something like this would have been brilliant because then they could just, you know, monitor it and stuff. So I'm living in the wrong time. <laughs> Imagine, yeah, I can't, I can't imagine that someone yeah. walking into a, a a dorm room and seeing a bunch of large barrels with wires coming out of them going over very well these days. <laughs> yeah, true. That would be very <laughs> suspicious too. But uh, we've seen some crazy stuff in our, and we we didn't live in dorms. We rented a house, and we had some fun stuff going on. <laughs> yeah, the only time I've seen something like this before was uh, when I was down in Orlando. I always went to uh, like weekly meetings or biweekly meetings at this uh, coding company. And it was really cool because they'd buy you a beer afterwards. So that was always the best part. Uh, but they had their own custom setup to where they could actually track the beer usage in, in their office. And so they had like three or four keg raters and on a display above it, you could see how much was left and what was being served and all that kind of stuff. But I've never seen it in like a packaged product like this. So. And this is for the brewing of it. It's not even for the consumption of it, which is completely different. It looks interesting. It looks like the, there's a, a DIY hydro, hydrometer, which looks oddly enough like Gavin's uh, grass sensor things. And I, I guess you kind of have to like build this thing yourself and uh, pop it in or something. I don't really know how brewing works, but the product is good. So that's all and I really the, care about. <laughs> the app is called the Brew Father. There you go. <laughs> oh, man. It's really cool. They have a big giant layout and everything where you can go in and look at recipes and stuff. Yeah, it's not bad. You know, sometimes it, to me, it looks like too much work. I'll just go to the beer store. Mm, yeah. Yeah. That's, I don't know. People like, people do like to do this. Like, yeah, it's like cooking, cooking on the grill and everything. People like to brew beer. I think my brother was into like brewing beer and wine for a while. So I'm not sure if he's still doing it, but what he did make was pretty good. I don't know if he'd ever do something like this, but you know, that they were. I don't know. Kind of cool. I have a client that makes his own wine because he gets bored. So he gave me a bottle one time and I was like, mm, I don't know if I'm going to drink this. When, when do you think I should drink it by? He's like, I don't know. <laughs> it's 
So let me know if it's good or not. <laughs> it's an experiment. I'm like, mm, I'm good on that. <laughs> Thank you, though. Yep, yep, yep. You never know. You never know. It could be something great. Well, if you have any feedback, questions, comments, beer, picks of the week, or great ideas for the show, give us a shout or send us a beer. Our email address is feedback at hometech.fm, or you can visit hometech.fm slash feedback and fill out the online form. All right, uh, a project updates. Oh, I guess I put myself on here first and then everybody else filled out later. But um, you guys made fun of me enough last week. I, I, I got busy and I did some projects around the house. Uh, the uh, stove vent was not one of them. <laughs> Still not done. <laughs> That's only about two years behind. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. After after our pick of the week last week, I did order that anchor outlet. Um, I did get it in. I did open the box, and I I walked with a screwdriver in hand, and um, over to the outlet I was going to replace. And um, someone was standing there and said, "What are you doing with that?" And I'm like, "Oh, this is our new charger outlet." She said, "It only has one outlet." I'm like, "Yeah, isn't that great? You can plug in more things." And that did not go over well because the outlets in this case are more important in the kitchen than um, than the chargey things. So back that went to Amazon. And I guess instead of paying for the $30 one, I'll be paying for the $50 one because of course. There we go. That's why you got two quick of the weeks, guys. I should have stuck with my instincts. Two outlets. <laughs> <laughs> you should have asked before what her requirements yeah. were for the kitchen outlets. Did not, did not do that. I, I, I was convinced that the single outlet was better by you guys, but nope, dual outlets is required. I was like, you have one right here. Just, I don't put stuff on that side and I need two outlets here. So that was the end of that conversation. And I just walked back and put it back in the box and filled out the return form on Amazon. <laughs> you just got to do these. You just got to install these things, Seth. Just get it over with and be like, nope, this is the new way of life. That would have been bad. <laughs> that would have been very bad. <laughs> just convince her that that was there the whole time. You know, we've only <laughs> ever had one outlet there. What are you yeah. talking about? Two <laughs> outlets? <laughs> Gas lighter. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. You plug it in your USB toaster again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's got 60 watts it could totally do USB-C hosting ah <laughs> uh, man yeah so th- th- did not get that done but I did I did well I have been working on a project for work this little rack thing behind me um, I put a sh- picture of that in the show notes maybe but if you're going to any of the Cedia Tech Summits that we will be attending which should be the one in Florida and maybe the one in Austin but I'm not sure about the one in New York um, we'll have it there the, 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 the other thing I worked on was I, I bought an Aquara Hub for my door lock and I plugged that in and pressed one button and the door lock paired with the hub. And now I can open and close it remotely, I guess. Didn't really do anything else besides that. I really don't know what I would use the hub for other than more Aquara products, I guess. Which speaking of, I did buy an Aquara product. I bought an FP2. So I got the little sensor thing Ooh, because the other day, the club. yeah, the other day my wife was in the laundry room and like, I have one of those, I think I talked about this. Like I have, um, the sensor, like as soon as you walk in, boom, it would come on six years. It's been working fine. No battery replacement, nothing. Walk in, boom, comes on. But the thing is I have it on just a dumb timer and I'm too lazy to do anything else with it because yeah, I am. I don't know. I'm just too lazy. I, it, it, it doesn't, and it's a long skinny room that we put on to like the back of the garage. So it's like the full width of the garage, dual car garage, but it's skinny room. And the little thing where I have it at is perfect for the doorway. As soon as you walk in, boom, lights are on. As soon as you walk in any door, lights are on. But if you sneak all the way down to the end of the laundry room where this thing can't see you, the lights will eventually go off like after five minutes or something. But if you're folding laundry and stuff, the lights will go off. And that becomes a problem when there's projects and stuff going on in the laundry room and there's no like override switch. And I could program all that in, but I didn't want to. I would rather spend this money that I have on an FP2 that you guys have been bragging about for months and months and months and months and months. And I saw the little interface of the people walking around and sitting on Gavin's couch at, at CD. And I'm like, oh, that is too cool. That's like future. That's the future. So I got it and I installed it. And it works well. It worked too well. In fact, <laughs> the first complaint I got was, why when you walk by the door here, out right outside the laundry room, d- does it does the light turn on? And then instantly turn off as soon as you step away from the door. <laughs> like, I could probably probably tone that down. And I, I, I guess I had the little extension of what the room was a little bit further out. The documentation so good on that thing oh so no don't like, don't don't ever read yeah, acquire no, no, documentation no, never there was never. none it didn't make yeah. any sense the stuff yeah. that was there so yeah. i just kind of like feel my way through it i think i got it i think i messed it up it doesn't work as well but it works it doesn't do that anymore but what i really need to do is have a timer on the thing so like it doesn't turn off i mean it as soon as you step out of the room within 
I don't know, two seconds, it's off. And I, I don't think there's anything else like there <laughs> on the market. Like it's, it doesn't detect you through the wall. And it, I, if you turn it up a lot, it will, it can, it, <laughs> it can get these like ghost images of people being in the room that aren't in the room that are maybe in the next room over, which it picked me up a couple of times, but uh, you kind of, you can kind of tweak the sensitivity down a little bit but wow what a what a really cool product i think if this was introduced into the like the professional market probably be like a 500 dollars product or something ridiculous especially with a cool little like space age interface where it it like tells you where you are in the room and you can like walk back and forth and set the boundaries and and all that like oh man what a really what a really fun product i think there was like what 80 dollars or something like that yeah um, yeah it's I so mean, worth it. Yeah, definitely. The, definitely. the, the problems you're, you're experiencing is like, yeah, add a little timer so that, you know, I, when, mo when it stops detecting someone in that room, wait 60 seconds before turning off, for example. So right? they don't notice. Yeah. Yeah. And then on the map where you draw your outline, what I did is I would walk around the room and figure out where the edges it was detecting was. And then when you have your walls and everything, everything outside of that, set it up as an edge, like, Basically colored yep. the whole thing. And then it no longer will see you through. It will no longer see you through the walls or it, even if it does, it doesn't care because it says you're outside of the area of monitoring and that, that gets around it. But honestly, like I have two of them and every time I go into the app and I see, you know, the little people on it moving around, I, I don't know why I find it so amazing. You know, like I can look in my family room right now and I, I see the wife sitting on the couch and it, it, you know, I can see her move to the other edge of the couch, like how accurate it is. It, it, it amazes me every time and setting it up. At first I set it up. So when I sat in my little chair, the lamp would turn off uh, or turn on, you know, and I got up, but that was just, you know, like a, that's cool. It detects me in this chair, you know? Um, but I turned that off and I'm just more amazed that. It, it, unlike a PIR sensor where if you're sitting still, it stops detecting you. This thing will, you always knows you're in the room. Yep. And you know, a millimeter wave to me is the future when it comes to presence detection in a room. I just pasted a picture of my little skinny room. So you can see it's only two squares wide. It's not, it is not wide at all. So it was having all sorts of weird ghosting issues with me walking into the garage or whatever. But yeah, as soon as I figured out that your door's not even in the same room. Yeah. Well, you can put little stickers, I guess they call them on there. Uh, but this, it does, the door doesn't swing that way anyway. I don't know. I think it affects how it works and I guess I could delete that, but I don't know why it's about where the door is. And then I don't know, like it, it, it really does work as advertised ish. Like there's a lot of tuning I want to do on this thing, but can't because I don't really understand what the settings do or, and they're not explained. Like, <laughs> yeah, it. like yeah. And where you have that little door set up, mark that as an exit and entrance as well, too. That affects detection, right? Hmm. Um, it will know that somebody's going out there. Interesting. Okay. I'll try that. Cause yeah, it's about in that, that square area or whatever. So, um, but yeah, it, it is as soon as you, step into the that little as soon as you step over that square as soon as you step into the laundry room boom it's on just like the other one and as soon as you leave it goes off now that's my problem so here's my handicap gavin um home kit home kit is my handicap here because there's no timer it doesn't have a timer and I, I found a plug-in for homebridge that gives me a timer. i don't know the documentation is even worse well you haven't it, integrated this with your home assistant i Oh, come on, Seth. Seth. Is it, like, what's the point of having Home <laughs> Assistant when you're not using it? You know? They use it for like two devices right now. Use it, Graphs use and it for that. You know, uh, you gotta, <laughs> if you added this to your Home Assistant, you can easily set up those automations with a timeout timer, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I don't know. I could I could do it. I could do that. But I, I, I kept it all. That's in. how the cool kids are doing it, Seth. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I was trying to do it all in HomeKit. And it doesn't have a timer thing. That's kind of disappointing. And so I will, I will revisit outside integrations in the future. What I really want is, is that data. I don't know. Can you get that data off the thing? Like how far you are away from, or like this entity is, no. oh man, that'd be so cool. Or that'd even really the number of people detected in a room. People have been asking oh, for stuff like man. that. They would love to see how many people are detected in a room, but no, you can't get that data yet. That would be brilliant. We're going to have to put a picture of what this looks like in, in the show notes. I'll have to go stand in the room to actually <laughs> trigger off the little person walking around. 
Um, but I have a long skinny room and you'll just see a green thing and everything red around it means, you know, that's not where you go. Uh, but yeah, just to kind of visualize what this does, it is insane. Like yeah, absolutely crazy. I, I, when you show, you're showing off in, in, in Denver, you were showing that off at the bar. I was like, oh, that, that's, that's, that's the future. That's space age. What I want to do is like put it in my daughter's room. Like, and I, and I, okay, I do have one major complaint on this product and products like it. Um, somebody needs to come out with a, a way of, um, doing, uh, figuring out the pin on the USB so you can install this properly. Cause having a giant six foot USB cable or nine foot or whatever the heck they give you with no power supply, by the way, like, yeah, you don't need one of those. You have plenty of laying around. Um, no, I needed a power supply, had to plug it in, but it's just a bunch of garbage wire hanging off the back of this really cool looking product. And there's really no way to install it. And I think they do a lot better if they could like, just give me terminals. Like I'll hook up a power supply to it. I have no problem doing that. No, they won't do that. It's USB. So somebody figures out like what the USB pins on it are or whatever. And then like makes a product where you can just like easily clip that in. And it has like a whip and you can take some CL2 rated cable or CL3 rated cable, or whatever it is out to where you want to go. Cat five. That'd be great. Um, I, this thing would take off. I mean, I, I could put this in my daughter's room, like in the ceiling yeah. and detect where she is in that room. If she gets out of bed, oh, we would know. She wouldn't, I don't have a door sensor. She doesn't get out of the bed. There's no camera in there. Like leaky, you know, Wi-Fi cameras or anything like that. I don't like those. The RF cameras don't like those either. You, you can decode those and, and that kind of thing. So it's kind of, it's, there's going to be a day where I take that out, but like no one, no one where she's like in the bed or not like at night without even having to open a camera. Oh, that'd be great. That'd be awesome. Yeah, and I guess since there's no documentation, you didn't read it. But if you're going to mount it in the ceiling, it kind of ruins the detection. Um, to mount, if you mount it in the ceiling, fall detection works, but then room presence is kind of iffy. You lose like, you lose a lot. Of, like, it can't monitor the whole room. It just limits you to a little space. Um, you have to actually put it in the wall. And there are people that have been saying the same thing. We hate the fact that it has a USB cable that we have to run down our wall and plug in. Yeah. And some people actually have designed little mounts that they could put in the ceilings or the walls and they ran the cable up into to their attic somewhere and plugged it in up there something like that but i know like we could probably 3d design a mount that has poe or something um uh, you know integrated into it and, and 3d print off something and you know maybe you can run a poe to it and have that poe convert over to the usb power yeah you know, it's, it's such something. a nice looking product like it looks yeah. great and in and the problem is is it has like you look at the instructions, which are there and tells you what height to put it. It's basically eye level. Like it has to be at eye level. Yes. And like, you're going to see this thing. And the only reason no one has seen it is because I put it in at the very end of the, the thing. That's where my breaker panel is. And that's where my, <laughs> that's where like the sprinkler system is. So there's already junk there on the wall. No one's ever going to notice. I just, it has a magnetic base and guess where that magnet went right on the panel. <laughs> so yep. it's like, it's no one noticed a little white circle thing there and they're not going to, but that's what's, you know, set up and run in the room. And it, it runs it better than it, it, you know, if you're in the room, the lights aren't going to go off anymore. So that's good. That, that was the goal in their app. They have those like presence detected loss after X amount of time, but it, you can't get those events outside of their app. As far as I can tell, there's no way to like, well, spit those out. If you set it in the app presence loss, maybe it won't turn off the switch in home kit until it's past that. No, time. it's the, it's the home automation. Oh, if it's in there. Oh, okay. There if then okay. stuff. Yeah. So yeah, it, if, if it was all acquire, I could do it, but I, I, I want to, I want to get it out of there and either use home kit or probably, you know, home assistant, home assistant, to, you could do it yeah. for sure. And I really wanted to put one of these in the bathroom. Right. But, um, yeah, same with you. I don't have an outlet in my bathroom. Or want to put it at right? eye level. Like, oh, that seems like a mystery. You know, like my bathroom, it, my bathroom's, a. Um, two pieces and in the place where you know you have the toilet and the shower and stuff there is no outlet in there all i have is a switch and a light so i'd have to install a, oh i see if or find like a poe adapter and run a network cable or something up into there and see if i can convert it over but it, it's a great device um and uh, there's other millimeter wave um sensors you can get that people are talking about but it doesn't have these features in them like the people detection zone detection a lot of them don't have that feature and this is where this excels and uh, it's really impressive when i show people yeah for 80 dollars, i mean it's that is there, there are motion sensors in the pro world that cost $80, you know, yeah. like it's insane what they're doing with this and like the little interface and app that you get off of it. Um, 
Yeah, it's, it's a fun toy. It really is. Uh, so thanks for keeping plugging that every week until I finally bought one. So I'm going to have to chalk <laughs> that on my, my scoreboard over here. We probably shouldn't add it up, actually, now that I think about it. Oh, no, let's, let's not talk about that, total cost. We could put it in Home Assistant. <laughs> you could talk number of first, devices, just not cost. Not cost. <laughs> yeah, first row of home tech. Don't talk about yes, cost. Yes. <laughs> all right. Well, that's all. I mean, it, I mean, that'd be all I have, but that's all I've got this week. I, I Took a long time that, talking about that. There was there's a lot of fun stuff with that, and of course the annoying install thing. Like I really wish that there was another way to do that. Even a little, I don't know. There, it's such a, a nice looking device. If it could be mounted on the wall, flesh mounted on the wall, it'd be way better, way better of a nice, nice looking device. So maybe in the future, one day, one day. Hey, well, Gavin, you talked about three three D printing my mounts for 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 the the acquire there uh what what have you been up to it looks like you've been doing some 3d printing oh yeah but before i get into that i just want to let everyone oh. know a home assistant 2023.10 20, <laughs> dropped oh right oh. so well go seth go not not yet seth because you know we record by the time you edit this show and release it it will officially be out but you're probably five updates behind anyway so you could go ahead and hit update now if you want but some of the um it it wasn't a major update, but there's something really cool that I'm still waiting to see what they do with this. But they introduced private BLE device support, and they're talking that you'll be able to do things like track an iPhone or a watch, uh, Apple Watch or even an AirTag possibly for room um, presence. So something to what you do, t- you're, you were working on, TJ, um, you were tracking people in a room. You might be able to start doing that with the latest update. So I'm waiting to see what they say about that and what capabilities they update. So if that's something you're interested in, keep an eye out for that. But in terms of projects, this week was all about 3D printing. Um, basically, you know, I got the new iPhone and then there's all the hidden costs behind getting an uh, iPhone, I call them, because you got to get new cases. You got to get new mounts for your cars. And in all my cars, I have um, the Pro Clip mounts where they make a base that fits your car specifically. And then you have to buy the, the piece that will fit for your phone, right? Well, each of those pieces for the phone was going to cost me $50 plus each. So I started looking at 3D printing something and I designed a little um, MagSafe ho- holder you know, a mount that I could attach instead. And, you know, for $2 each, printed nice. some out, put them in the car. Wife actually loves it because now she just, it magnet, she just puts the phone on there, sticks on, it doesn't fall off. Um, she's like so impressed. She's happy with it. So if she's happy, I'm happy. We're all happy, you know, and that was my 3D printer is starting to pay for itself. That's all I have to say. <laughs> when I told her, I go, it cost me about $2 to make this, or I could have paid over $100 for the mount. She's like, okay, okay, it's adding up. It's, you know, it's earning its keep. So I'm like, all right, great. You know, I won't tell her how much power it uses, though, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, I needed, like, I have a pretty flat desk and not many drawers on it. And I saw somebody designed a drawer that you could just attach on your, so I 3D printed a drawer. Like, think about it. Like, I 3D printed a small drawer and put it <laughs> on my desk just nice. to throw random small things in that I'm sitting on my desk. So, you know, if I haven't convinced you to get a 3D printer yet, maybe I will soon, you know, because I'm having too much fun with it. Took me a while to get the FP2, but... <laughs> <laughs> 3D printer right around the corner. Yeah, a little so. bit more expensive, but it's worth it. It's so much fun. If you have the time, though. Yeah. I was say, Seth has a lot of time to design stuff. Yeah. So. And that's the fun part is designing stuff. You look at projects differently when you, you're you actually designing it yourself and you're not like just looking for somebody else's design. You look at it and you say, oh, I can just, I can design that in Tinkercad and you throw it all together and you put the screw holes in and, you know, done, right? It, I've gotten to a point where I could design something and like, half an hour and have it you know start to print up from there it's pretty cool yeah there's a lot of design programs out there for 3d stuff but tinkercad does such a good job it was hard for me to try to invest in my time yeah. into like anything else because it's like it's so easy to like just create everything and it's just using like shapes and everything yeah so, I mean, it's very rudimentary in how you can actually design things, but it just, the way it works is very simple and it's not hard to go from like nothing to a printable object. Get one, Seth. No, I was looking at the dash mounts. <laughs> oh, I have a, the ones I have specifically are pro clip ones because you, you, they make them specifically for your car so that they kind of snap into the panel somewhere. 
right? Um, and you don't yeah. want to screw it on. It doesn't clip on a vent or anything. And they're really mm-hmm. cool. Um, but they're not cheap when you compare them to other things. But now that I can 3D print a different holder for it, we already have the bases now. We're good now. We're going to just print me a whole mount, Gavin. I want to give this a shot. Uh, if you want, then you got to measure the car and everything like that. And I already had the base, you know, I could have done the whole mount. You can design, a, you know, if you measure everything out, you could design it yourself if you want, right? Oh, you can get a charging case and everything. Huh. Yeah, I just went with the MagSafe, uh, just a MagSafe holder in it, and you just plop your phone on it. It grabs it and holds it right there. And then Bluetooth's to your radio. Like, it's so easy. It's so nice. You just um, I don't get one of those holders that you slide it in because the lightning port, well, you guys are all USB-C. Now you're going to need USB-C cable and, mm. you know, all sorts of. No, just get a MagSafe. It works with everybody's phone from an iPhone 8 up. No, I'm looking. I, I haven't. I haven't run across this. This com- I think I've heard about them before, but I haven't run across them. So you, yeah, I'll have to. You can get me to spend money on a car now. I don't want to spend money on. <laughs> Jeez, uh, I've had ProClip for years now in all my cars, and I love them. Just they're clean installs. Yeah, no, they look great. They uh, they have some that like clip over the vents, which I do not like because that is just you can't do that in Florida. It's, Those are always awful anyway. Yeah, and and they have one that that clips on the like the side of where the radio would be so yeah. that that one makes sense uh, I, I could do that i think <laughs> yeah, mine just my phone just goes on the passenger seat now because i have carplay in both vehicles so yeah fancy just over there but then I, the problem too is that it slides around and falls off the ground and yeah, this is better than like sticking it onto something with some sticky tape and then it falling off or whatever mm-hmm. so yeah that's eh, that's pretty cool i like it buy it seth mm, it's in the cart we'll see what happens <laughs> I, I have more investigating to do. Well, if you have any questions, ask. <laughs> we'll do. We'll do. <laughs> I'm always here to help um, you spend money. A Magic Mount <laughs> Pro 2 Extendo suction cup phone mount. That looks fun. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> Extendo. It's got an Extendo on it. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, okay. So, DJ, what have you been up to uh, over the last week? Well, I've got a couple small things going on right now. One of the bigger tasks I've been doing is cleaning up my home assistant stuff. And so when I set up the home assistant server, it was like when we were first just got possession of the house and I, need, I needed to set up, you know, smart switches and cameras and whatever else I was installing at the time. Um, but I wasn't like doing it in like a concise manner like Gavin told me to do it. And that's just because I, I just didn't have the time. I just I just wanted to make things work. And when you want to make things work, you have to sacrifice quality sometimes. <laughs> and so I've been going through and I've been deleting automations that don't work. I've been renaming automations so that way they're similar. So like, you know, just if it's a thermostat automation, I put thermostat and then like a little dash and then whatever it does. And then, you know, exterior and, and whatever else, just so when I'm looking for it, I know exactly where to go and I, I can have an idea of, of what is there. Um, and I started doing that with devices and everything else as well. And, and all this is because I need to actually start getting a lot of my automation set up. You know, I got some basic stuff set up. I got, you know, the exterior lights turn on when, you know, 30 minutes before sunset and, you know, the bathroom light turns off with motion and stuff like that. But I want, you know, to be able to set up location based stuff. So whenever we leave the house, uh, you know, the camera turns on, the robot vacuum goes and all that kind of fun stuff that you normally do with automation. That's what I'm working on now. And I feel like it's a good time to do that because I just got the the rack kind of cleaned up and, you know, prettied up and everything like that. That was kind of that's kind of been a dumpster fire. Um, it's not finished. You know, I know, I know Gavin's going to look at the picture and be like, oh, that's not finished. You're giving me grief for all these different colored screws and stuff like that. Only because just, you gave you know, me grief. <laughs> Well, absolutely. And, and I feel like that's reasonable, but it, you know, it's an ongoing project. It's not done yet. So I, I think I get a pass for the moment. Uh, one of my Innovelli switches actually broke. Um, I'm not really sure how, but it just, it just didn't turn on anymore. And so I was able to get that replaced. They made the RMA super easy. They just, you know, they said, you know, what happened? How are you using it? And I told them and they mailed me a new one. Hmm. So that was nice. super convenient. As far as I know, they're not even taking the old one back, but I mean, it doesn't really do me any good anyway, so it's kind of just sitting on my desk until I decide to break it down and recycle it. 
And then I bought an Apple Watch. I bought a Series 9 watch. Ooh. Because I was like, you know, I, I, I don't wear jewelry. I've, I've never been like a necklace person or a watch person. I, I've worn watches in the past, like when, depending on my job. And so I used to work at a summer camp. And, you know, making kids be on time for things is kind of crucial at a summer camp. And so I wore a watch everywhere I went because it's not responsible to pull out a cell phone everywhere. (laughs) But, you know, I I was like, I've been hearing a lot about Apple watches and I'll I'll go ahead and give one a shot. You know, Best Buy is pretty good with returns. And so I bought it from Best Buy and I was like, I'm definitely going to return this watch and I'll give it a shot for a week or two. And, you know, I won't be out anything besides like maybe $20 to at and because I got the cellular version. No, oh, nice. Because my goal is to not carry my cell phone with me, depending on where I go or what I'm doing. And that just doesn't seem to be a reality for me at the moment. Hmm. So some of the apps I wanted to use, like the remote start for uh, Nicole's car, isn't supported without being connected to the phone. Oh, that's ridiculous. Whereas my remote start for the van is. There's no native app support for the VoIP system I use, Open Phone, but like you'll get notifications and stuff like that because it mirrors, you know, the iPhone and everything. It it seems like a good device, and the battery life is good. I think I've had it on all day, and it may be down to fifty percent battery life. Hmm. So I mean, the battery life isn't a problem, but I just I don't know if I'm going to find use out of it. And not being a watch person anyway, I just I, I think it's it's not going to happen. But maybe Seth here will convince me. I just sent you an invite on your Apple Watch for the walkie-talkie so I can walkie-talkie you over my watch. Oh, oh send me, send me, send me. <laughs> That's what I need. You know, I also use my watch when golfing. So, you know, like, I know you're not, you guys don't golf, but when I'm golfing, I actually can look at my watch and shows me, you know, the distances to, like, um, bunkers and stuff. So it comes in handy when you're doing, like, even if you're doing workouts and stuff like that, it comes in really handy, like, doing stuff like that. Hmm. I didn't. I didn't get an invite, Seth. So maybe you sent us the wrong TJ. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, oh. You know, after all that, TJ, what one thing I, the only thing I really heard you talk say was like you didn't listen to Gavin, and Gavin was right about setting up Home Assistant. You know. Um, yeah, that's all right. That, that's a clip I'm going to use that we could promote on you know social media later. So you can put it on Mastodon where nobody else see it. What do you mean? Mastodon, I get more engagement from than anywhere else. I think <laughs> the Twitter's uh, formula just filters out all my stuff. It's not mm, important enough. That makes sense, actually. Right. But on Mastodon, I get a lot of replies and stuff because everyone sees it. Yeah. And you're important. It's all nerds. Um, but my last update for Apple products is that I had a Urban Armor gear case, which I've been with Urban Armor gear for like eight years or something now. They make kind of rugged cases. I would compare them to OtterBox but without being obnoxious. I feel like OtterBoxes are just like too crazy. And unless you work in like an oil field, then you probably don't need an OtterBox. But these ones are a little more rugged. But I returned it because it had a cutout for the action button. And... I don't, have you guys had have you guys bought a case for your iPhone? Does it just have like a regular button over the action button? I got the um the fine woven case. So I've always had the leather case on my phones, and since they canceled mm-hmm. that and they gave me the fine wove no, whatever they call it, right? Um I got that case and it's nice. My only complaint is that it has a weird texture to it that every time I touch it, I get goosebumps, right? And the <laughs> it, this is the weirdest thing, okay? The only way I could stop that from happening is is to imagine that it's actually like a fur or something like that. Like, this sounds really weird, but when I do that, then I don't get the goosebumps, and it's like, yeah, you know, man, I shouldn't have said this on the (laughs) podcast, but it's going to be left in anyway, so I'm kind of getting used to it. I feel like if I... This is going to sound even worse, but... The goosebumps are feeling good yeah, at this point. If I, I touch you. it harder, then I don't get that weird feeling that gives me the goosebumps, and I'm not helping my case. <laughs> Go back to your case. Uh, well, speaking of cases, I don't have a case on my phone, Ooh, and I've been going, danger. been going naked for the past, like, four Ooh. days, and I looked at my phone right before we started this podcast, and I'm pretty sure there's, like, three small scratches on my screen. <sighs> Not not bad for a week and a half old device. I oh, I I mean I give up on that almost immediately. I have to uh, to to put on um, what are these things called the a glass screen protector the, or something? Yeah, the Spigen glass 
Oh, yeah, yeah. I get them off Amazon. They have the little mount. They like you just I'm so good at these. I even put one on the little iPad mini I got because I was I had it for like two days. I'm like, mm, this is going to last like I will break the glass in no time. So, yeah. Oh, if you have Apple Care plus like you can. Yeah, that's why I have Apple Care. They'll just replace it for twenty nine dollars. <laughs> uh, it might be a little bit more than that. <laughs> I think I think it, like has it increased. I think the glass break was like a hundred bucks or something like that. I don't remember last time I had to do it. Yeah, I think the the screen itself, because I just had one done. So the, at least on my 12 Pro Max, I don't know if it's different for the 15, but if you just do the screen or the back, it's only $29. Oh, okay. However, if you need the whole phone replaced, then it's a hundred dollars. Oh, maybe that's what they had to do. And that appears to be correct. So it's still $29 for screen or back glass. Uh, accidental damage is a hundred dollars and then theft and loss is $149. So for the price of three cases or, you know, for the price of three uh, screen or back replacements, then that's how much my case costs. So I think I'm just going to risk it for now. It's a risky life, man. I, 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 um, I, I can't, I, I didn't put that on the same day. It would be, it would be, I would have dropped it and it would have been over. The, the other ones actually broke all three cameras somehow. I, I don't, and it had a case on it and the screen protector. So now I guess I need a little circle protector on it somehow <laughs> to go over the camera lenses, but I don't know. Um, oh, well, that's, that's just me. Um, I will eventually scratch the heck out of this, this watch here. Gavin, I sent you an invite too, and you're not answering your watch. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you know in a week when I break my screen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've never, I've had this walkie talkie thing on this, on, on, I've had Apple watch forever and I, I walkie talkie my wife and she's like, she's like, um, I'm not using this. She turned it off. So I've never been able to talk to anybody. Hey, Gavin. I don't know. Uh, it just keeps saying you're not available. We'll figure this out later. Yeah. It, I've never actually been able to make this work or get it to work or use yeah, it. So I've it's never been used on the watch. It. Yeah, forever. <laughs> no one uses it. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna do this in the middle of the night. Just oh, nice. Oh, uh, awesome. Nice. <laughs> yeah. You're gonna be. You're gonna be 11 o'clock at night, and you're gonna be like, you're gonna just gonna hear my voice come over your watch. Your idea of the middle o'clock, the middle of the night, and mine are way Wait, different. I don't, I don't. <laughs> yeah, I'm already in bed by two hours by the time that comes around. Those messages I send on Slack at 3 a.m. are not me going to bed. <laughs> <laughs> There's still a couple hours left in the night, my friend. <laughs> all right, all right. Let's uh let's move on here. Um maybe one day we'll figure out the walkie-talkie yeah. says no one's available. Yeah, it's not <laughs> working. I got, I got your invitation and I accept it. It just so. says not available. <laughs> yeah, I it had you on there and uh it it then it said TJ is not available and and gave up on life. So, I don't know. We'll figure it out. Maybe by next week we'll have working home assistants and Oh, yeah, there you go. Gavin's calling me again. Hey Gavin, how's oh, it going? How do I get out of there? Oh, okay, now <laughs> it's working. We'll, we'll mess nice. with it later. <laughs> It's actually convenient. <laughs> if I wanted to call Gavin, I'm like, hey, man. At the middle of the go. night at like 1030. <laughs> <laughs> Here, man, you forgot to upload your audio. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we do want to give a big thank you to everyone who supports the show, but especially those who are able to financially support our show through our Patreon page. If you don't know about the Patreon page, head on over to hometech.fm slash support to learn how you can support home tech for as little as a dollar a month. Any pledge over $5 a month gets you a big shout out here on the show, but every single pledge gets you a, a, an invite to our private Slack chat, the hub, where you and everyone else can get in there and talk about all sorts of fun stuff this last week. And I know we talked about those Leviton, uh, not the, the switches, oh, yeah. the yeah, that was, that, that was a big deal. Uh, if you want to help out but can't support the show financially, totally understand. Just appreciate a five-star review or positive rating in whatever podcast app you use. Uh, that's going to wrap up another week here on Home Tech. Everybody have a great weekend, and we will see you next week. Take care. Till next time. <laughs>